Before I start, I want to thank James Monero because I got this quote from an article that he wrote. Um, an actual battle of styles, as for instance, between realism and abstraction, that, that desirable only to those who thrive on the feeling of partisanship. Both directions are valid and useful, and freedom to produce them uh, and enjoy them should be protected as an essential liberty. There are, however, serious reasons for taking sides when one kind of art or another is dogmatically asserted to be the only funicular of Parnassus, or worse, when it's maliciously attacked by the ignorant, the frightened, the priggish, the opportunistic, the bigoted, backward, the vulgar, and the venal. Those who love art or spiritual freedom cannot remain neutral. That's a quote by Alfred Barr, and uh, Alfred Barr is the, he was the first director of the MoMA uh, Museum of Art, Modern Art in New York, and uh, it's a quote from 1949, and the fact, you know, it says so much, but the fascinating thing um, about this quote is, is that, uh, you know, modern, the modern and contemporary art movement back then um, was pretty much in the same position, I think, that uh, uh, the realist movement is now. And uh, but, um, uh, basically, what, you know, from what I get from this, it sounds like they pretty much became what they were fighting against in the beginning. So, um, let me start with questions. <coughs> So, um, Jacob, should uh, to the same journalistic standards be applied to art criticism? Uh, I would say yes. I wouldn't exactly. I mean, if, if when we say journalistic standards, uh, I guess you mean if you say something, then you should follow up and explain why it's true. The, the kind of what yeah, journalistic yeah. standards are. Yeah. I've often thought that would be very, very valuable. But I don't necessarily think those are uh, journalistic standards so much as they're standards of argument or standards of, of discussion. And I, one of the things I notice about the little tiny bits of criticism that I read uh, are that it, it, there's an awful lot of expression of team spirit uh, or of um, enthusiasm. Uh, without a great deal of explanation uh, or support for a real reason. Uh, so you'll uh, see some little piece of criticism that will say, this is uh, uh, an extraordinary, this is extraordinary, or this is sublime, or this is uh, important. And then read the rest of the article and do say why it was uh, sublime or important. So in that way, I think that would be, that would certainly be a, a welcome. Development. Although I don't expect to see that. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be, it would be great. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, every great art movement that has existed had um, a, a, a critical cheerleader or, or a critical explainer of, of that movement. The Sorry for the Renaissance, um, um, Ruskin for the Pre-Raphaelites, and um, Clement Greenberg, for the modernists, did a very good job in uh, trying to be a, a critic at a high level explanation of what was really going on in the artistic world. And, um, but we have four males here, and uh, what's interesting is that the, the body of art critics will come out of mostly art historians and, and artists, and um, uh, in the art, history world, uh, 29 out of 30 graduates uh, from art schools are women in, in art history. And uh, uh, so it looks like the next great art critic will be a woman to explain uh, uh, to, the, to the people uh, what the artists have on their mind and what the movement is all about, uh, whatever movement dealing with. So I, I think that uh, women are very literary, they, they have that ability to communicate. They'll be at the forefront, um, and we will see that soon. It won't be Romain Greer, 
uh, no, it'll be uh, uh, somebody amongst you or, or your friends will do that. I think that we have to have these critics. They have to be great. Uh, and without it, uh, realism, the no noble realism, uh, won't exist uh, in a larger uh, critical sense. James? Well, uh, just, I think, first to address that point, I'm not sure critics have tended to come out of the academy historically, so that may not actually bear, bear out that way. But just to take it back for a minute to your premise, which is, is the mainstream media missing an important cultural trend? Clearly it is. That's undeniable. First question to ask, is that necessarily a bad thing? I think being in the wilderness has its benefits, and I think this movement has benefited from being in the wilderness. At the same time, I'm a journalist who has tried my best to bring this movement to greater attention. Uh, it has not been easy. I have a small magazine, New Criterion. We're not the mainstream media by any stretch of the imagination. I'm able to write about what, what Jacob does. Um, I try to get it into a larger circulation of publications, and it's very difficult. So let me explain. I think there are two reasons why that might be the case. Um, two forces at play. The first is what I might call aesthetic political correctness. And that's a correctness that is prejudiced against realism historically. And what's interest, interesting about that prejudice is it has come from both the left and the right. Uh, I think concern over the political content that realist art can maintain. So in the 30s, you had realism associated with fascism or Nazism. <clears throat> and in the 50s, in the Cold War, you had realism associated with the Soviet style. What's interesting about that is, uh, of course, modern art really began in realism with Corbet, so it's quite ironic. So a, a certain etiquette has developed over 100 years, really, that I think has prevented realism from uh, being accepted. Uh, the second, and this is, I think, a very important distinction, is the rise of pop art and the empire of money that is associated with pop art. And that's related, but it's somewhat different as well. And I think that when you talk about what's really controlling the art world today, it's not the high modernist etiquette that I described before. I really think it's the money and the money associated with pop art. You look at the artists who are actually priced up right now, they're not abstract artists. You know, uh, Andy Warhol uh, or Gerhard Richter or Gerhard Richter, someone of a realist. But they all share a certain nihilistic quality that I think is inherent in pop. And they share uh, also an interest in what I like to think of as kind of bad art, lack of craft, silk screens, not high art. And so this movement, if it wants to infiltrate that world, has it, it has its own beauty working against it. The quality of this movement is in a way working against it from being widely accepted and priced up. Is what? Uh, it, 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 I think the beauty of this movement prevents it in many ways from being priced up like an Andy Warhol, let's say. Now, I don't think that, can, that, that wouldn't change. Um, I will say, if it is going to change, I think art critics will be the last people to know about it. Uh, the art world is not, maybe, you know, the art world may have been dictated by Clement Greenberg, uh, but it's not dictated by critics now. And it will be dictated by the collectors who finally accept this and realize there's something to it. And, and that could happen. Let's see. Well, remember to first of all, <laughs> first of all, I want to thank uh, the Portrait Society for putting this great work of them together, and uh, of course, this great talents such a great uh, Jacob, never met Jacob, just fantastic. But what you did with artists, 